the, the second part of what we spoke about the week before that. And it's about law versus grace. And I said to you, and I played you a little clip as well, of the confusion that we have today in that a lot of Christians are, in a sense, being lured or called back into the Jewish traditions, into the Old Testament. And I just believe that for us as a people, we need to have clarity on what the Bible teaches concerning this very, very crucial and important aspect. It is in human nature for us to want to do what we are told. We grow up like that. So when somebody says, in order for you to get to this place, you must do A, B, C, and D. And we kind of <coughs> okay with that because we were brought up like that. We were told about the things and the rules that we have to obey. And if you, if you look at life, if you look at life in general, if you're going to go for your driver's license, there is a process that you have to go through. And Des and I, we were at the licensing department last week. Um, unbeknownst to me is my driver's license had expired. And I did receive the notice, but just two or three days before the time, and you know when you receive those notices, it goes in that particular drawer or place or little shelf that you have, where like the, the, the utility accounts are, the water lights and so forth, and that one went there. And I just felt, let me have a look quickly. And I realized that I've been driving without a driver's license for two days. So then I said to Des, look, wherever we're going to go today, you can drive. So Des had to drive me around, and I quite enjoyed it for the day, I must say, <laughs> being chauffeured around. But there was a process, according to the law of South Africa, that I had to follow in order to obey that so I can be legal on the roads. If I didn't do that, and I get pulled over without a driver's license, no matter how nice I smile to the traffic officer, no matter how many scriptures I quote to him, no matter how many, uh, how many times I tell him, but I'm actually a pastor and he should have mercy. And by the way, when pastors do that, I want to slap them. You know, when they say, well, because I'm a pastor, can you give me discount? <laughs> really? You know, well, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? No! You obey as everybody else, man. It's for everybody. So we had to go in and we, we had to have that done. Those are the laws of the country and we have to abide by that. And the Bible speaks about that in Romans chapter 13. But this morning we want to look again at this thing called law versus grace. And I just want to slip through a couple of slides. And I do believe that this this morning is going to help you and I do believe it's going to liberate you. And we said there were two mountains in the Bible of great significance. The first mountain was the one where the law was given. Where the law was given to Moses, the Ten Commandments. And we're going to deal with this a little bit later on. And I am going to do something today on purpose. I'm going to just slightly, not completely, just slightly bring a little bit of confusion into your mind so that we can get the clarity from Scripture. And the confusion that is out there right now is, is enormous. It's much greater than what we can actually deal with in this morning session. But we have two mountains. On the first mountain, Moses went up. He was in the presence of God and he received what we so well know today as the Ten Commandments. He received the tablets. And I know there were many jokes made about that because today people walk with the tablets still in their hands all over the place. When they sit in the shopping centers at the coffee shops, they have their tablets out. But listen, the two, uh, the two tablets or the, the Ten Commandments were inscribed by God on the two tablets for the people of Israel, the nation, to have a guideline of God's requirements of what God requires. And it is amazing to me how what people have done in Christendom is they have taken the Ten Commandments and they've actually put it out there as like, whoa, you know, it, it's so heavy. It is, it is so extraordinary. It is so way beyond us that can anybody keep the Ten Commandments? We miss the whole basis and foundation of the Ten Commandments. I'm going to talk about that more as we go into the series because there are things we're going to deal with that's going to bring complete clarity on the Ten Commandments and how it stands today. Let me say this. 
The original intent of God for the Ten Commandments has everything to do with relationship and not specifically law. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that amen out there. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you, sister. <laughs> it was intended for relationship. What happened to Moses after he received the Ten Commandments and he made his way back down the mountain? What was the difference in Moses going up the mountain and Moses coming down the mountain? When Moses went up the mountain, I'm sure at that specific time, there must have been a bit of trepidation on the inside of him. Like, what is this about? God has a meeting with me today. What is this about? What is going to happen? And what happened when Moses came down and the Israelites looked on Moses? What happened to his face? Do you remember? It says it shone as the light of day. His face was bright. Now listen to me. If the law was such a dark thing, why did his face shine when he came down? Yes, pastor, but he was in the presence of God. Yes, but he received something from God for his nation to be in close relationship with him. Yes. That's a different take on the Ten Commandments. We're going to see later on as we go how it is that we as people think that when God puts a frame around something, when God puts a fence around something, that it's there just to spoil our fun, that God is spoiling our fun as people. That's why there are these regulations and these laws and so forth. When we look at this, this particular picture, it says, listen to this. It says, the do and the thou's, the, sorry, the do and thou shalt live. On the side of the cross on grace, it is already done. Romans 10 verse 4. You can believe and you can live. It's do versus done. Those two little letters, N-E, makes a huge difference in this whole conversation. It's not what you have to do. It what it, it's what has already been done. It's law versus grace. And then I want to ask the question again this morning. Under which one are you living? Under which one are you living? Now, there's the story. If I get this wrong, that's if you know the story, by the way. If you know this little story, which is a true story, that happened, I do believe it was in the mid-60s, when, I believe it was Billy Graham, was having a crusade in a particular city. And in the city, there was a prison, a very well-known prison. Now, as I said, I read the story a number of years ago, and it's just faintly in my memory, but I loved the conclusion of it, that's why I never forgot it. And what happened is, I believe it was six boys that were imprisoned at this particular prison. It so happened that on this particular weekend, where Billy Graham was holding the crusade, these six <laughs> boys broke out of prison. They managed to escape. And as they got out of the prison, there was this huge crusade going on, and they actually found themselves <coughs> in the stadium. They were under, the, under the, 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 the pavilion. And these six boys, because they were now hiding from the authorities, they mixed with the crowd there <coughs> under the pavilion. And what happened was they heard the gospel. The gospel was being preached. The saving power of Jesus, the Messiah, was being preached. And something extraordinary happened. These Six boys got miraculously saved. <coughs> All six of them accepted Christ as Savior right there in the crusade. But now they had a dilemma. You see, for what they've been locked up for, now accepting Christ, receiving a new heart, being a new creation, all of a sudden their conscience got attacked. Now they thought, what do we do? These six boys are now born again, saved by the blood of Jesus. And the, the basic, you know, there's always a leader. There's always a guy that kind of runs the, the show. And this boy stands up and he says, guys, listen. What we've done is wrong. We broke out of prison. If they catch us now, we are going to sit longer than one hour, what our sentences are. So I tell you what, let's go, let's go back. Break in. So the six boys... <laughs> this is a true story. Went back to the prison. 
handed themselves over to the authorities, was put back in prison. But here's the thing. Guess what happened inside that prison? These six boys who were now on fire for God, the Holy Spirit started working in them, and they started turning that prison upside down the right way up for Jesus. Did God have a plan? I think, I'm just thinking, that God had something to do with that escape. <laughs> when I look at the story, I think God just made a way so that they could get to the way, Jesus, yeah. then go back the other way, aim back into prison, and turn the place around. And from what I understand, because of good behavior, their sent sentences were reduced. I think God had something to do with that as well. Amen. Isn't God awesome? Yes. But here's the, here's the thing. What I have found... Now, that's a wonderful story, and, and, and it's great. But listen to me carefully. We who have been redeemed, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, the Bible says. And we can explain that later on. A lot of people misunderstand what that is. We've been redeemed from that by Christ. What I am finding in the days that we are living in now, and people wanting to go back to the Jew Jewish roots, is that people who have been liberated by Christ are going back into bondage. They're basically going back into prison. But the point is, and the problem is, they stay in there. How about you? If you were imprisoned, just listen to me, if you were imprisoned, and you got a a release that's a due date and you are released from that particular prison. How many of you would want to go back? If you look at the prison system or systems around the world, would you want to go back to that or would you appreciate your liberty and your freedom? Yes. Absolutely. How is it that in some people's thinking they feel they need to go back under the law and back under bondage and be ruled by regulations and dictators? Christ has set us free, guys. And in that liberty, we have complete liberty. And I think we need to get back to the place where we live and walk in this freedom every single day of our existence. Hallelujah. Now, we spoke two weeks ago about the incarnation, about the justification, about the manifestation, the declaration, the salvation, and the resurrection. And we got that from 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to go there with me very, very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're just going to read a portion of scripture very, very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 3. What is going to happen, and I think it's inevitable, is you are going to be approached by people who may invite you to a service, to a church service. And it's very possible that you may be invited to one of these services where they have all the, all the, the rules, laws, and regulation of the old Jewish traditions. And that they would want you to keep all of the, the feasts and so forth. And you say, well, do we still have to keep those feasts? We are going to discuss that because there are a lot of people that say, we as Christians should actually still keep those feasts. And we need to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Sabbath day as well because that's a huge bone of contention as well. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the last bit of that, verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And now it makes a statement and a declaration of what Jesus had done. It says, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now you can see from what I've just shared with you there, that screenshot that I have on the, on the board right now, it says... God was manifested in the flesh. That's the incarnation. That's the God, the God man coming into the earth to free us from our sin. Number two, he was justified in the spirit. That's for our justification. What does the word justification mean? Just, exactly, you know it. Just as if we have never sinned. So right now, once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you've been washed in the blood of Jesus. Do you stand justified before God? And the answer is, Amen. Yes, a big Amen. I'm justified in the presence of God. If I'm already justified by the blood of Jesus, why do people say I have to do works in order to justify myself before God? 
Isn't that operating from prison? Absolutely. And then it says, He was seen by angels. He was manifested in the earth for the redemption of mankind. He was preached among the Gentiles. That was the declaration that was made already. It is past tense. It is over. He was declared at that time. He's still being declared today. And he will be declared in the future. He was believed on in the world. That is our salvation. And he was received up into glory. That is the resurrection. How many of you know right now when you are seated here, you already have resurrection power on the inside of you. You have eternal life residing on the inside of you. Yes. So then and now, what happened? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it brings us in the, into our modern day, where we are right now. It says, the Spirit expressly says, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. I'm reading this fast because we are just recapping on this. Speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And then we say to you that God has made all things good, things that we can eat today as long as you pray over it. I remember one army guy said one time, when, he, uh, I, when, I, was, when I was a youngster and, and I left school, um, I, I wanted to go to the Air Force. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to accept me. I, I don't know why, but they just didn't want to accept me. So then, then I tried the police force, and they didn't want to pay me enough to become a detective because that's what I wanted to become. And then I wanted to go here all over the place. But I wanted to go to the armed forces. And I wanted to be in the armed forces. And, and I thought, I'll do well in the armed forces. But the point is, God had <coughs> other plans for me. And what was the point that I was trying to make? Um, <laughs> about the food. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm going to keep that woman. She's amazing. <laughs> a friend of mine that went to the armed forces, when he got, when he got leave, he wasn't on AWOL, he actually could come home. And he spoke to me, and he spoke to me about the food in the army. I'll never forget. Those of you who've been to the army, can I just see your hands quickly? All right. You guys, <laughs> you guys will know what I'm talking about. I remember the one day he said to me, he says, Juan, we used to pray over our food. He says, the one day, one of the guys prayed, he says, Lord, he says, he looked at his food, he says, Lord, bless this food to our bodies. Do something with it. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> but in the times we are now, and, and be free and liberated from the things that we can eat and not eat, there are those who are saying to us, you are not allowed to eat this and you are not allowed to eat that. And we've gone into that and we had a sermon on that. But I want you to go with me now to the book of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And you will remember the story there. I'm just going to give you a bit of background. Cornelius was a just man who feared God, the Bible says. It says that his whole family served God. Now, he was a Gentile believer. He was of the Italian regiment. And it says his family also followed God. And it says his, his, his generous giving was known throughout the nation. This man was a giver. And it says, and his arms and his prayers came up as, an, as a memorial before God. Listen to me. God sees all your charitable deeds. Did you get that? <laughs> Everything that you do for somebody else, if it's a charitable deed, God sees it and He records it. So when you are good to people, when you bless people, God is pleased with you. It says it's a memorial before Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So anyway, Cornelius was praying. It says he was a man of devout prayer. And he was praying the one day. And then the Lord said to him, There's a man that I want you to speak to. His name is Simon the Tanner. Uh, his, his name is Simon, Simon Peter. And he's staying with Simon the Tanner. So it was a Simon and Simon situation. <laughs> and Simon was with Simon. And what happened was, Peter was also busy praying. And if you go look at the time, it was more or less the same time that God spoke to both of them. And, and Peter was praying, and the Lord brought a sheet down from heaven. How many of you remember that? And it was tied at the four corners. And it says that it had all kinds of four-footed beasts on it, all the creeping things and birds of the air. What did God say to Peter? Peter, kill and eat. And Peter looked at the animals on the sheet, and he said, uh-oh, 
There's some pigs running around there. And there's some other animals. And there's some, there's some creeping things. And some birds of the air. And uh, he says, now here's Peter. Not so, Lord. I cannot eat anything that is unclean. What does God say? God said to him, kill and eat. He says, Peter, what I have cleansed and called clean, you cannot call unclean. I think that deals with the crayfish and pork issue. <laughs> you see, and I want to make this statement again. What people have taught as doctrine was merely preference. Don't come and teach me what your preferences are. That's between you and God. You see, if I want to have, if I want to have, <laughs> Let's go to the pork thing. If I want to have a pork fillet with prawns and mushrooms on top of it and, and shrimps. What do you call it? Pork down prawns. That falls under the creepy thing. <laughs> but if I want to have that, listen to me. And it says there in Timothy, you read a bit further, it says, For everything that you eat, listen, is sanctified. By the word of God and prayer. God can turn whatever is on that plate, man, to prime beef and prime steak. God can turn it. Why? Because it's sanctified through the word of God and prayer. You must eat according to your preference. And we're going to deal with Romans chapter 13 and 14, where I show you that it's the law of conscience that sets you free because it's an issue between God and you. <clears throat> and there was a kind of an amen there, and you will see that I can prove that through Scripture as we go. But listen, in the next one, do you want to be out of prison, or do you want to go back to prison? Do you want to go back into bondage, or do you want to stay free? Not about you, I want to stay free. Law versus grace, I want to be on the side of grace. Now, does grace do away with God's law? <clears throat> This is a question, when I talk about this, so many people have asked me, says, you want, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does this do away with the Ten Commandments? Does that mean that I don't have to do the Ten Commandments anymore? Again, people want to run away from the Ten Commandments. Let's go there. Exodus chapter, let's hear it, 20. Exodus 20. Guys, you should know where the Ten Commandments are, right? It looks like you've moved on so far that you forgot where it is. <laughs> you are so far under grace. <laughs> Exodus 20. Now watch. Let's, let's see if you can answer this question as we go. Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What does God stay, what does God stay by and move by and say here? Yeah, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the house of bondage. I'm the Lord your God. What does that speak of? What did I say earlier on? That speaks about relationship. I'm the Lord your God. Do you remember the time that God said, but I want to be your God. I want, to, I want to be your king in this nation. And they said, no, we want to be like the other people. We want to have a king over us just like the other nations. And remember who was chosen over them? A, a, a man by the name of Saul. Because they wanted to be like everybody else. I want to say to you, it's a very dangerous place to be, to be like everybody else. It seems like they've got it right. You stay right and you stay with God. Here it is. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Can I ask you? If you are under grace, which you are. Do you under grace want to have another God? No. No. Uh, thank you for that. Not at all. So what is that saying? You are already keeping the first commandment. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> and people say, well, pastor, should we keep the ten commandments? Absolutely. This one says, you shall have no other gods before me. Number, the, the second one, you shall not make for yourself any carved image, or it's the same one, for any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, 
or that is in the water under the earth. We are not supposed to bow down before images. We are not supposed to pray to images. And any religion where there are images where people bow down and they kiss their feet or whatever they do, it's prohibited by Scripture. Now can I ask you, you being under grace, do you do that? No, no you don't. You are keeping that commandment. Yes. 